Thank you for joining us today for this Future Development Strategy Community uh, webinar. I'm Anna McKenzie, one of the of Tasman's Future Development Strategy project team members. Sitting beside me is Jackie, our growth coordinator, and Maya, one of the policy planners in our team. This is a collaborative project between Nelson and Tasman. Nelson will be conducting their own community engagement process, so please go to their website if you require any more information regarding it. Sorry, we're just waiting for the slides to catch up. If you wish to ask any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. There will also be an opportunity during the presentation to ask questions. So we'll have a lot of touch points um, during this presentation where you can ask questions and we'll answer them as best we can um, during this webinar. Um, we will, if we don't get through all the questions, we will answer them afterwards. Um, please don't use the chat function. Um, this has been disabled. Um, and if you wish to remain anonymous, please be aware that we will not be able to answer your question via email after the webinar um, if we don't get to it during the event. I'll now um, pass you on to Jackie. Okay, thanks Anna. Hi everybody, thanks for taking the time to join us today. So the purpose of this um, community webinar is to really let everybody know that we started work on the FDS. We actually started work on it um, back in July and um, we've been doing some background work that we'll share with you. We want to make sure people are up to speed for where we are. We're also um, asking you for a couple of um, important feedback um, points in the presentation. So we've got a couple of questions we want to put to you and encourage you to um, mail your, your feedback to us using the Q&A button. And we're also going to explain uh, a bit about the process in terms of how we go about selecting potential housing or business business sites for assessment in the FDS. So the agenda for today is just first of all to provide a bit of a project overview for the FDS and a bit of background to the project. Some of you might be more familiar than others with the future development strategy from last time. We're also going to um, share with you the draft um, strategic outcomes that we're currently working on for the FDS. Now, these are important because they will inform the councillors in terms of decisions that they'll make on sites and whether or not they should go in the FDS if they meet those strategic outcomes. We're also going to explain a bit about the opportunities and constraints mapping that's currently underway for Tasman and Nelson. And then finally, a bit more about the site assessment process. So feel free to put through any queries at any time on the Q&A button. Otherwise, um, we will connect with you each time when we pause for a questions break. And if anyone has any problems hearing us or anything, please also just let us know on the Q&A button. We're hoping it's all clear. So just first of all, what is a future development strategy in FDS? So this diagram here just tries to put the FDS in some context. So at the top, we've obviously got the Treaty of Waitangi, which informs the Resource Management Act. And then from the RMA, we have a number of government, central government, national policy statements on a wide range of topics. So one of these, which is the most relevant, is the national policy statement on urban development, um, because that actually requires us to prepare a future development strategy. But there are a range of other MPSs we have to also consider uh, on some things such as um, freshwater and highly productive land, just to name a couple. Now, the FDS is not actually a statutory plan. It's currently non-statutory, although that might change um, through the Resource Management Act reform that's currently underway. But even though it's non-statutory, it's actually a very important plan within council um, and informs the whole range, really, of council plans. And this includes our long-term plan, our 10-year plan, our infrastructure strategy, which is part of that plan, where we forecast and um, the infrastructure that's going to be required for the next 30 years and our financial strategies in council. And the FDS also informs our resource management plan, the review of which is underway. We're currently working on the new Tasman environment plan that you may have heard. So 
The FGS doesn't zone land, but it highlights um, where potential growth sites might be in the future. And then they are proposed for rezoning through the resource management plan or a plan change. So what is a future development strategy? So it's a 30 year growth strategy. And as I've already mentioned, it, it identifies where and when housing and business development may um, occur in the district. So it provides the zoned, or soon to be, I guess, zoned land for that development to take place in the next 30 years. And it tries to sort of sequence it by decade. So 10, 20 and 30 years. It also now is required to show um, trunk infrastructure that's required for new development. So by that, I mean things like the three waters, water, wastewater and stormwater. It could be transport, it could be reserves and recreation facilities. So the FDS has to actually spatially, spatially identify those corridors. And then also the FDS now has to identify um, constraints on development so that it shows what we call no-go areas. So those are parts of uh, the district where due to the number of constraints that exist for development, um, the council wouldn't want to see any development there. So as I've said, um, the FDS identifies the location of development in the future. Um, the National Policy Statement on Urban Development also um, has strengthened Iwi and Hapu contributions to the FDS. So they are now a core component. Uh, we've already started engagement with EWE um, a few weeks ago. And yeah, it's basically a, a strategic plan which informs all wider council decision making. And it's fair to say that council has taken on board the 2019 adopted FDS very well. Um, it's used you know, by the councillors and also by staff in our future planning. So a bit about the process, um, it's quite a tight timetable. So um, it's only 12 months to prepare the new FDS. And the reason for that is that the National Policy Statement on Urban Development requires us to have an FDS adopted in time to inform our next long-term plan, our 10-year plan. And so that would be the 2024 long-term plan, but the council actually starts work on that in August, 2022. So we have a very long lead in time for the preparation of our long term plan because of the sheer volume of work the staff need to do in terms of um, budgeting for future infrastructure and determining exactly where new growth may go. So since July, we've started on um, what we call swap analysis, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and constraints. And we've been looking across the Nelson and Tasman region in that respect and there's currently mapping underway. Uh, we have a GIS consultant on board who is mapping all that for us. We've also been busy developing some growth options. So by that, we mean some broad spatial options in terms of whether our goal should be to concentrate on building up through intensification or on, on building out, spreading out a bit more, or even new settlements. And we've also been devising um, what's called an MCA, which is a multi-criteria assessment. And that's where we're actually currently drafting about 25 different assessment criteria, which we'll talk a bit more about later. And any potential development site is assessed against each and every one of those criteria and comes out with a score to show how, how well it fares as a future location for development. And then towards the end of the year and early next year, we're going to be busy actually drafting the future development strategy. And that will go to the two councils for adoption um, so it can be taken out to the community for consultation and that will happen in March. So straight after that, our formal consultation period starts and that's where we are inviting submissions from um, anybody on the draft FDS and you're also able to attend a hearing if you wish. And then we're working towards adopting the FDS, both councils adopting the FDS by next July. So the green arrow just shows where we are at the moment. We're at a sort of a community engagement period, which unfortunately has had to be online due to current COVID restrictions. Um, but there will be more opportunity next year to make submissions and uh, have your say on the draft FDS. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the context for the FDS. So I've already briefly mentioned that we uh, prepared an FDS 
before, and that was adopted by the two councils in 2019. The image on the slide there on the right just sort of crudely shows the locations of the FDS sites from that strategy. Um, there's a range of sites there, as you can see, including intensification sites for housing, greenfield sites for housing, and also some business sites. And we actually found capacity for about 14,000 dwellings approximately across the Nelson Tasman region. Now, um, given that plan has been adopted for over two years now, and because Tasman in particular is facing extreme growth pressures, the council has recently um, agreed to start proposing the rezoning of some of these um, growth sites. And so I'm going to just hand over to Anna, who's going to tell you a bit more about that. So as um, Jackie mentioned, we've just commenced work on um, growth plan changes for these areas, Motueka, Richmond South, Murchison, Marple and Brightwater. Uh, these areas were all adopted as part of the 2019 Future Development Strategy, and we've brought them forward so that we can address the growth pressures in, the Tasman, in Tasman. Rezoning of these sites will provide an additional 3,000 residential lots, roughly, um, and we are looking at having these plan changes uh, notified by the middle of next year. Uh, community engagement will be commence in March, well, in, in around March is what we're aiming for. Um, so there will be an opportunity to become involved in um, these growth plan changes. Um, and more information will become available on our website if you're interested. Okay, thanks, Anna. So that's just sort of showing how um, the FDS does get implemented in practice. So those were all FDS sites that were adopted in 2019, and we're now moving those forward and proposing them for rezoning. So just a quick look at the numbers um, for Nelson and Tasman. So on the screen here, we've got just some high level figures. This is for the uh, both, both regions together. And Nelson and Tasman separately did a large housing and business assessment earlier this year that was required by central government, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, that found capacity um, on currently zoned land, or in Tasman's case, some of that was deferred zoned land, for about 16,000 dwellings. Now the FDS has to sort of act as a bit of a safety net. So we can't just plan for limited growth um, we have an obligation under the Resource Management Act and the National Policy Statement to actually accommodate growth demands. So that's not a, an option for council. So we look at what we call a medium growth scenario and a high growth scenario. Now, that, that's in terms of population growth. So the medium growth scenario is probably the most realistic scenario. That's the one that's actually um, in our long term plan in terms of numbers. And according to that, we would be short of about nearly 5,000 dwellings. So that means we've got to find land for about 5,000 dwellings. <clears throat> if we also look at the high growth scenario, and that's where we have um, higher fertility rates and increased international migration, then we'd be looking at a shortfall of about 12,700 dwellings. So that's obviously a lot more challenging. Um, but the idea is, is that the FDS, um, hopefully, we don't know yet, we haven't done the assessments, but hopefully we identify enough capacity to cater for a high growth scenario should we need it. <clears throat> now on the business side of things, um, we're currently working through the high growth scenario, but the medium growth population scenario tells us that we need about another 34 hectares of commercial land in Nelson and Tasman. And of that, 20 hectares is actually needed in Tasman. And for industrial land, we need about 14 hectares, of which all of that is actually needed in Tasman and none in Nelson. So conscious that we've gone through a lot of information there, and um, some of it might not be that familiar to a lot of you. So if there's any questions or anything you want to clarify at this stage, then please just use the Q&A button now, and we'll just pause for a minute. So we've got something here from Kendra, hoping that the fertile soils and productive land of all the Waimea plans will be preserved slash protected for the long term future as a considerable strength to our region. While housing remains a key priority, it is entirely inappropriate to be using the low lying land in order to retain it for food production. 
Yeah, so um, it's a good point there, Kendra, and we'll talk a lot more about that later in the presentation. Um, it was a priority last time in the FDS, and it remains a priority, especially for Tasman. Tasman has large amounts of highly productive land around its towns. Um, Nelson, I guess, less so because it's more urbanised, really. But we'll come back to that shortly. Um, another one here. Do we have any say from councils about whether our immigration numbers are high or low? Say from councils. Um, so it's not really the councils that determine immigration. That's determined by central government policy in terms of um, changes of the rules to visas, um, entry to the country under different job categories. Um, obviously, with our borders being closed, we have had very, very little international migration, you know, for the last 18 months. But in actual fact, Tasman is a destination for people to move to from within New Zealand. So usually between anywhere between half and three quarters of our population migration comes from within New Zealand. So it's for that reason that we don't really project um, you know, a, a big downturn in our population growth in Tasman. Nelson is a little bit different. Nelson sees more international migration as a rule. Um, but yeah, that's one of the reasons why we're still seeing a lot of um, activity in Tasman and certainly lots of houses still being built. It hasn't really slowed down. All right, those are all the questions for now. Okay. So if we just move on now to the um, strategic outcomes. So these are draft strategic outcomes that we're currently developing. And these are going to be important because um, the role of these directions is to guide decision making on the FDS for the councillors at both councils. So in terms of how we put these um, directions together, what we've done is we've already asked the community a number of times lately about their views on, on growth. And we've had a lot of feedback through the council's long-term plan very recently and through the first draft of the, um, or rather the sort of initial information that's been put out there for the Tasman environment plan. And so we've collated all that feedback together and had a look at it to save asking people the same question over and over. Our strategic directions are also informed by the government's national policy statements on urban development, as well as other legislation and other relevant national policy statements. And what we're going to do next is just to share with you some of that feedback that we've had from the community so far about their views on how we accommodate growth. And Maya is going to go through that for us. So to date, our community has told us that they want us to intensify our centres um, growing up, not out, to allow for more housing, better infrastructure and more efficient use of land. When it comes to housing affordability and choice, we've been told to support initiatives like inclusionary zoning, funding and fee reductions. We've been told to support smaller homes, such as tiny homes, uh, also non-traditional multi-unit dwellings and housing for all ages and family types which includes first home buyers and the aging population. We've been told that intensification should be in areas that are well serviced and accessible. This means improving active and public transport, improving roading and wastewater infrastructure and providing for new development. We've been told that waste management needs to be improved, particularly throughout the Tasman settlements. And we note that a small number of people have told us that they oppose growth entirely, or at least until significant improvements to infrastructure are made. Uh, there's a strong consideration of environmental, landscape and cultural values, which includes avoiding development on productive land, improving water quality and supporting intensification to minimise climate change impacts. So we've also been told to avoid developing on land that is vulnerable to sea level rise, reduce emissions through accessibility in higher density, maintain the unique character of our areas, balance tourism benefits with impacts on residents. Uh, and when thinking about intensification, we've been told that this should be alongside more 
public and community facilities, which includes public spaces and green spaces for all ages. So I'll just pass you back to Jackie to talk about the draft outcomes. Okay, thanks Maya. So what we've done here is we've had a little um, sort of infographic put together. This is actually loosely based on uh, what we call Richmond South, which some of you may have already recognised. Um, it's actually sort of based on one of the FDS 2019 adopted sites actually, which goes up to White Road for those of you who know it. Um, and what we're trying to show here using this diagram is some of the draft outcomes that we're currently working on, which we'd like the FDS to try and achieve for future development. So the number on the graphic corresponds with the text on the left hand side. So we'll just go through those and explain a bit more about them. So the first one is to do with urban form, supporting a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Now the little um, picture there of a multi-storey bu building is really just trying to suggest that we need to be striving to build up as much as we can and achieve efficiencies um, in terms of use of land with intensification. And that may be on brownfield sites, already developed sites, or it might be on greenfield sites like this one in Richmond South. And also um, in, in terms of trying to achieve that outcome, it's important for new development to be well situated in terms of transport accessibility. The second one is um, a little bit similar. That's again about trying to make the most of our existing towns that we have in the district. We have a large number and trying to really consolidate and intensify instead of um, creating more and more uh, locations within the district. And try and make use of services in nearby centres. The third one um, is about new housing being focused in areas with good access to, to jobs, to schools, to social facilities and shops and services. And so again, that's really important in terms of where those new development sites are located. And the fourth one just shows a little picture there of some townhouses. And um, that's just reminding us of the need in Tasman in particular to provide for a range of housing choices. So in the last FDS, our council recognised that people come to live in Tasman for a wide range of different housing types. So lifestyle blocks are actually very, very popular in our district. Um, but it's really about providing a range of housing choices so that people can choose a more intensive housing form if that's what they want. And then number five is um, referencing the Resource Management Act and the National Policy Statements on Urban Development, those sort of non-negotiables where there's a territorial authority that's growing, we have to actually try and provide enough um, serviced and zoned land to meet those demands for housing and for business. Number six covers um, new infrastructure and is just making sure that if we're going to be identifying new growth sites, that we also consider the infrastructure that's needed for those. And that could be the three waters, transport, recreation reserves, all those things. And then just carrying on, uh, this second slide using the same graphic, but just focusing on some different outcomes. So number seven is um, all about the natural environments and uh, the need to maintain their unique attributes. And that could cover things like wetlands, and areas of indigenous biodiversity. Number eight is very importantly talking about the likely future effects from climate change. So um, just sharing there those arrows away from the coast. So reminding us to take into account the forecast sea level rise and um, flooding, inundation um, from the coast and also coastal erosion. So in the last FDS, we actually um, really steered well clear of the coastline in terms of any new development sites. And we ensured that any sites we included were five metres above sea level for that reason. Number nine is about risk from natural hazards. So the diagram there shows a sort of a heavy rainfall event, which obviously could lead to flood hazards, but um, also we've got other natural hazards to consider and those include um, fault hazards, liquefaction and land instability. And so those are all assessed as well using criteria. And then number 10 is all about the productive land, which we touched on earlier. So Tasman, um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending how you look at it, 
is as a lot of the towns are surrounded by highly productive land, in particular Richmond, Chueca, Tarpica. And there is that tension there between trying to preserve that land for food production, but also trying to provide good sites for housing that are close to town centres. So it's not easy. Um, we have resource scientists at Tasman who, who assess each site for us in terms of productive value of the land. And they look at a very wide range of things, um, which not only include the soil types, but also the prevailing land use and the local climate, which can have limitations for crops that can be grown there. The elevation of the site, because again, that can affect what you can grow on the land. And also the topography in terms of the slope and the aspect. And then there's other factors as well, such as the size of the sections, the size of the land parcels and how efficient they would be for food production if they weren't developed. And then the final one, number 12, um, these are going to be outcomes which are going to reflect EUE and HAPU aspirations. And we're still currently working through those with EUE, um, so that's a work in progress, but there will be some that cover that aspect as well. So I'm going to pause for another question break. Um, we wanted you to sort of think about whether there are any strategic outcomes that you think that we've missed, that we haven't covered on those previous two slides. Um, if you want to put any thoughts through, or if you have any other questions or clarifications, then now's a good time. We'll just pause for a minute. So we have a question here, in terms of up or out, do you have to leave choices to the market or can you nudge towards up rather than out? So it's a good question. Um, it's largely determined by the zoning and the rules um, that go with that zoning. So if we're looking for intensification, we will have denser plan rules which allow things like smaller section sizes, um, uh, smaller setbacks, higher building heights, things like that. And um, living in a rural district like Tasman, we don't have a huge amount of opportunities for intensification. And I say that because we simply have a large number of towns, a high number of which are small, and have actually quite few areas that would be suitable for intensification. So to make intensification feasible, um, you need to have you know, good sites that are close to the town centre. Um, preferably you need areas where the housing is quite old because otherwise it wouldn't be commercially feasible to remove that housing and redevelop the site. Um, and you need large sections. So you try to find an area with older, larger sections where you could maybe replace one house with three. So what we did in the last FDS is we tried to find as many areas as possible that would be suitable for intensification. And we found some in Richmond, Mochueca, Wakefield and Brightwater. We're having another look again in this FDS to see if we can find any more. But it's fair to say that it's harder to find those suitable areas in Tasman than it is in, say, in Nelson. So Nelson had a much higher proportion of its housing to be achieved through intensification. Okay, that was the only question, so we'll move on. Okay, we'll keep going. If you have any more, just send them through while we're talking. So we're going to just um, dive into now the sort of opportunities and constraints mapping process and talk a bit as well about the different assessment criteria. So currently we have some consultants working with us and they are trying to map all these opportunities and a small number of, uh, sorry, all these constraints and a smaller number of opportunities across the region for Nelson and Tasman. So you can see on there, there's quite a, a wide range. Um, SNA stands for significant natural areas. They are mainly constraints. Um, opportunities could be things like accessibility, um, the fact that there's already infrastructure, whether it's water or transport there that could serve a site, um, proximity to social facilities or even the port or airport. But the vast majority 
that you can see on the screen there are constraints. And so we map all those and that helps us to identify where a good area would be for development or where it could be a no-go area, where there are just too many constraints for development to be feasible. So in terms of how we pick sites that we might um, assess in the FDS for their suitability for development, we're actually encouraging the community right now to um, contribute and to make any suggestions that you want for future development sites. And we'll tell you how to do that shortly. We've also taken on board proposals that were put through the Infrastructure Acceleration Fund. So you might have heard about that in the national media. That was a central government initiative where they've made a large sum of money available to help councils provide the infrastructure for development. And our council made a submission on that with some uh, suggested sites. And so we had about 15 different sites that came forward as part of that process. So we're also going to include those. And then we've also got historically a number of sites which have been talked about at council through our growth modelling. So we have our own growth model that we use to actually, um, in, in some fine sort of detail, forecast how many houses we need over what time period. And we've obviously been looking at the district for many years. So we have a few sites that have also come through out of that process. So I've mentioned the multi-criteria assessment a little bit. Um, I've actually got the criteria here today at the moment. They're still draft. We've got about five different versions, but we're, we're heading towards a final set. We've got about 25 different criteria. Um, but I won't go through all of those today, but we can pick up some of them through the Q&A if you're interested. But we thought what we'd do is just take you through the different categories of the criteria so you can get a sense of the kind of thing that, that we're evaluating. So the first criteria is, sorry, the first group of criteria are on urban growth and form. And that's about measuring things like accessibility from the site and to public transport routes or to active transport routes such as cycleways. And it's also about considering um, if there's potential there for intensification, so that's the building up again or if it's more about greenfield expansion. And we're also looking at the development capacity that a site can yield. So just going back to those uh, requirements of the RMA and the National Policy Statements on Urban Development, and the fact that we have to try and find enough capacity to meet demand, it's important to get a sense of the scale of a proposal and how many houses it may be able to yield or how many business lots. And also what the scope is for providing for a range of housing types on that site. So is it all going to be about lower density housing, which may not be an efficient use of the land? Or is the scope on that site to actually do a, a nice sort of cohesive development where you've got what we call medium density housing um, on, the, on the flatter parts of the land? And by medium density, I'm, I'm meaning kind of smaller sections, attached dwellings, um, maybe even some low rise apartments, that sort of thing. And then the third important category is infrastructure, which is obviously crucial for future development. So the criteria under that category uh, measure the transport accessibility of each site. If it's private, we do private, public and active transport accessibility. We look at the three waters servicing in the area. We look at proximity to schools and parks. And we also take into account things like reverse sensitivities. So that's where there could be conflict between future residents and the surrounding land use. And that may be, for example, airport noise, as mentioned on the slide there, or it might be things like um, spray drift from a horticulture um, grower that could be affecting nearby residents, or it could be um, inconvenienced by being on a freight logging route, route all those kind of things. The next group of criteria covers high productive land, which we've mentioned a couple of times already today. So it's a really important one for our district and we have to carefully evaluate the quality of that productive land, you know, how productive is it? And can we redraw the boundary of the site to avoid some of the best soils, for example? Or are there no other growth options at all for that town and therefore we may have to use some productive land? And that did happen in the last FDS, we had a, a very small number of sites which did actually 
involve using highly productive land because there was no other growth options for those towns. And the other category is on climate change and natural hazards. So, so that's looking at things like um, coastal flooding, coastal inundation, coastal erosion, and also the liquefaction, fault line, proximity, and land instability hazards as well. And then the final two categories um, are on the natural environment and EWI and happy values. And the natural environment is um, very importantly having regard to the national policy statements on freshwater. So that is looking at how development may impact on wetlands, for example, or surface water bodies such as rivers, streams, springs. And it's also looking at the impact of a development on significant ecological and biodiversity. And the council has just recently undertaken um, a mapping exercise of outstanding natural landscapes and outstanding natural features. So um, that's sort of draft stage, but that's some use useful evidence for us to use to assess any future sites against to see how they might impact on those landscape values. And then the last um, categories, uh, criteria categories, are EWI and HAPU values. And again, still working through those as we engage with EWI and HAPU, but we feel confident that one of those will certainly be the impact on sites of cultural significance and cultural landscapes. So I'm just going to show you very briefly um, how we actually use these criteria. So the example we've got here is on accessibility by active transport. So we're looking at the accessibility of a future development site um, to those active transport routes or public transport routes. And so the consultants help us with some software that they have, and they would measure the, um, the distance to those routes that are available from the site. And um, if it's scored poorly because perhaps um, you know, accessibility wasn't good and it was going to be over 30 minutes away from those kind of facilities, then it would only score a one. But if it was a well located site on the edge of a town, say, that already has mature kind of public transport routes or, or even planned public transport routes, of which we have a number in Tasman, um, and it was also near to active transport routes, then it would score well and it would score a five. And basically what we do is we do that for each and every one of those 25 criteria so that you get an overall score of the development site in terms of how it's performing against the criteria. So we're just going to pause again and um, we thought we'd just ask you whether or not you thought any of those groups of criteria are more important than others and whether you think that um, some criteria should actually have some weighting. So initially we're just going to be scoring everything raw uh, with no weighting at all. We'll just score each site against each of those 25 criteria um, but then we'll be talking to the councils uh, to see whether they feel that some of those criteria are more important than others and whether they should be weighted. And then that will obviously affect the overall score of each site. So if you want to use the Q&A button um, to center any comments or any general questions, then now's the time. So our first question here is, what do you think is the optimum height for intense residential development? Um, that's a bit of an open question. I mean, all I can really say is it varies according to location. So you would expect to find higher building heights in Nelson at the moment than in Richmond, for example. Um, at the moment, under our Richmond intensive development area planning rules, which is already operational and we're already seeing medium density development, um, as a permitted activity, you can go up to two storeys. Uh, it's about seven, seven and a half metres. But that doesn't stop you from, from proposing a higher building. Um, so you can have a taller building. It just means that uh, it may be a bit more difficult in gaining resource consent because you'd have a few more conditions to meet. Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously I'm from the UK, so I'm used to multi-storey buildings is, is the norm, but um, it has to be appropriate for the location that you're in. And Richmond was until quite recently a relatively rural service town, but it's grown very rapidly. So I think over the years we can expect to see taller buildings and denser development, but it will it will be a gradual process. 
Another question here on traffic flow. Grant has said, current traffic growth, especially in Lower Queen Street, has created a real bottleneck. What plans are being developed to improve traffic flow into and out of Richmond in particular? Yeah, it's actually been a common theme at the other webinars, actually. Um, just in case people don't realise, the, the Lower Queen Street area um, in the Council Resource Management Plan was largely going to be a major employment area. Uh, what happened was the central government, the national government at the time, a few years ago, introduced a special housing area legislation. And so down Lower Queen Street, we have about two or three special housing areas that came out of that process. And that was a central government process where it didn't matter what the zoning of the land was, you could propose housing pretty much on any site, provided it met a couple of criteria. Um, so we've now ended up in a situation where we have um, a lot of houses down in that area that we maybe didn't envisage, which has contributed to the very fast uh, traffic growth congestion problems. But there is another project underway. Um, I've got a leaflet here, which I don't know if you can see, but it's called the Richmond Transport Programme Business Case. Um, consultation finished on this just recently. A colleague of ours has been running this. Um, and it's a joint project with NZTA, Waka Kotahi, and they're looking at ways to try and improve transport reliability in Richmond. And it covers the whole of the Wainia area, um, but it joins up to the boundary of Nelson's project, which is called the Nelson Future Access Project, which you may have already heard about. That's been going on for a few years now. So there is a lot of planning underway to try and improve the transport accessibility um, around Richmond and Nelson. And um, if you want to find out more information on that, you're probably best going onto our website and just putting in the search bar, the Richmond Transport Programme Business Case. Bit of a mouthful, sorry. Another one here. Do you have thoughts about the possibility of future managed retreat from central areas of Nelson? Where would they retreat to? So that's a question for Nelson, I'm afraid, which um, we're not able to answer. Um, Nelson City Council is running its own webinars. If you go onto their website, um, they've got a couple. I believe one is this Friday and then there's one the following week. So that's probably a question for Nelson, that one. Another question here. Will we be leaving corridors for retreat of species and land from sea level rise? Um, corridors for retreat of species and land. It's not, not something we've given um, thought to particularly, but it's something we can think about. And um, I can have a chat with our colleague who is dealing with the Coastal Hazards Project. Um, we can probably um, answer that question for you by email if that's all right. Um, one here, what coverage is in Richmond will Tasman be moving to, perhaps 60% or greater? So coverage, I uh, wonder there if we're talking about building coverage, we probably are. Um, so at the moment, under the Richmond Intensive Development Area Planning Rules, you can um, have building coverage of 50%, but site coverage of 75%, the difference being Site coverage includes all your hard surfaces like um, tarmac areas, um, you know, garages, carports, all those kind of things. Um, that was a bit of a leap forward for the council a few years ago. But as I said earlier, I think intensification is going to be something that's going to be continually evolving in our district. And through the Tasman Environment Plan, which is already underway, all those rules are being reviewed. So um, it's probably a good idea. We can pass on that feedback to the plan team, actually, in terms of the building coverage rules. Another one here from Joanna. Emissions reductions during the next 30 years is crucial. So weighing should go to those criteria that will lower emissions for sequestered carbon. Yes, OK, so that's the greenhouse gas emissions um, that's been identified there as being crucial. Yeah, and obviously we've got the Zero Carbon Act as well, which is something that's come out since the last FDS. So that's something that we need to take on board. Um, it'll be questions like that that we'll be putting to our councillors in due course, asking them to, um, to feed back to us which of those criteria they think are the most important. But clearly that is a really important one. We have legislation that's requiring us all to work towards that. So, yeah. And then the last one here is 
It sounds like TDC is saying going up is too hard and is placing itself into the developer's place of working out whether cost effective rather than, <coughs> sorry, rather than enabling the potential. If there is potential, then it may occur, but without providing the opportunity, then the current rules do not enable this to be considered. Okay, well, that's a fair comment, I guess, that we can reflect on. Um, we're not saying it's too hard. We're just saying that we spend a lot of time working with developers and builders and understanding the constraints they face. If it's not commercially feasible, they're not going to do it. And one of the problems we have is that our land values are very high in Tasman now. So if a, if a developer is redeveloping a site, removing an existing house and replacing it with three dwellings, you know, the figures have to all stack up and he needs a very um, high, high, high house price to actually make that um, development feasible. So that's whereby things like the, the location of the site, the access to facilities, the size of the site, being able to get maximum amount of development on it are all really important in contributing to that commercial feasibility. And we have to actually demonstrate to central government that our intensification areas are commercially feasible by doing um, feasibility analyses. So all I'm trying to say is that um, there'd be a little point in designating an intensification area over a brand new area of housing, for example, because no one's going to pull down a brand new house and replace it with three more. So it's just about being uh, realistic and um, trying to be commercially minded when we're looking at for those areas. Those are all of the questions for now, so we'll keep going. Okay. So I think we're moving to the final couple of slides now. Um, so this period of community engagement runs until Tuesday the 26th of October. We've had four webinars. This is our final one today but there's still plenty of time to be involved. So if you go to our website and if you just put future development strategy into the search bar, that will take you to the FDS webpage where there's lots of information. There's also a previous recording in one of our webinars there if you wanted to um, <laughs> watch it again, but you probably have enough today. Um, if you have any suggestions for sites that you'd like us to consider, uh, you don't have to be the landowner, you could just be thinking that you, you know of a good location. Then there's a little feedback form on that website. If you could fill that in just with some very brief details so we can identify the property, then we'll run that through the multi-criteria assessment process. Equally, if you have any more queries in general on the FDS, then we have a bespoke email address, which is shown at the bottom there, future development strategy at tasman.govtnz. If you send through any queries on that, we'll get back to you as soon as we can uh, with an email response. So finally, just in terms of what we're doing next, um, when we've finished our community engagement, we'll be concentrating on assessing potential development sites in the FDS. We've got a large number already suggested, over 80 new sites for us to look at in addition to the previous FDS sites. So that will be occupying our time in October and November. Then we'll be moving on to actually drafting up the FDS, ready to start public consultation in next March or April. And that's the formal process where we are hoping, COVID rules permitting, to do face-to-face -face engagement sessions. And you'll be able to um, talk to us at those events and also make submissions on the draft FDS and attend the hearing as well if you so wish. So that was really all we had to say today. Um, I'll just check if there's any more questions that have come through or comments before we close. Sorry, I've lost the... No more questions, just no more a comment. Questions. Okay, well, if anybody has any queries, please please do feel free to email us at the email address and we'll get back in touch with you. But for now, thanks for your time, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you.